Ted, thank you very much for being with us. You are the director of the Center for Healthy Air, Water, and Soil at the Environ Institute at the University of Louisville. What is the Enviro? So the Enviro is a, a wonderful and exciting idea, and that is um, the other half of the coin. We all know that we are somehow a product of our genes and our environment, mm -hmm. and we've created this thing that we're all excited about called the genome. And there's all sorts of science around our genes and all the omics, all the kinds of technologies around uh, what our genes do and how they express themselves and all that. But, you know, we also know that there's this environment piece and we don't have a clever name and a understanding of it. And so we came up with Envirome as a companion to the genome. And we're very focused on that really deep understanding of what role the environment plays, mm -hmm. our environment, in how healthy or sick we will be. So how do you take that philosophy and apply it to public health? Well, I mean, I, I honestly don't believe there's such thing as public health without the environment, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if we all could just exist as well as possible as we're born, that'd be great. But the truth of the matter is people are born into very different circumstances. And uh, many times those circumstances aren't a good fit, mm -hmm. you know, for what their bodies need. And when they're put in situations where they're in a situation that is distressing or not nourishing enough or whatever it might toxic in some way, mm -hmm. then they're going to be sick. And so public health at some level, at its core, is really, I think, designed to take into account these factors and, and how do we really get our arms around them to keep people well, keep yeah. the public well. How do you take, you know, with what you're doing at the Institute, how do you apply that to health promotion and public health? So I think the field of public health is entirely predicated on the idea that our environments are what uh, make the biggest effect on our health outcomes. And so people are born into different environments all over the world, and they have different kinds of health outcomes depending on whether those environments are supportive or those environments are dangerous to them. Mm -hmm. And I think as a field, public health is really designed to give everybody uh, a, a good chance, a fair chance at, at thriving. In 1970, the Clean Air Act was passed. And in the United States, the air has gotten better, but I don't think we could say that it's really all that good. At least I wouldn't want to. So what are some of the new threats that are emerging, and what impact are you seeing in terms of air quality and our health? I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, we, we lived in a very uh, awful time industrially in the Industrial Revolution. I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, also a city that you had to have your lights on in the middle of the day if you wanted to see where you were going. Um, and so absolutely we're not dealing with pollution that looks like that anymore in most of the United States, but we are learning about the whole spectrum of what we would call polluted air. And while we've definitely tackled, let's say, the pollution that you can see in many cases, though not always, um, we're learning that these very, very small particles, ultra-fine particles, um, are a new frontier, not regulated by the Clean Air Act mm -hmm. at this point in time. Um, we're learning about air toxics, volatile organic compounds, and really what their health effects are. And, and so while we've made progress on the things that we can see, mm -hmm. we have a lot of work to do on the things that we can't see that we know are uh, impairing our health. And so, you know, that's the, that's the never-ending challenge for us. The environmental pollutants, known and unknown, are they affecting all of us equally? Or are there certain segments of our population that are being hit more than others? I think the word hit is a really good word. Right? So, I, you know, at the end of the day, when you're dealing with chronic disease, right? You're, I'm not talking about a, a traumatic event, an infectious disease that, that might take you down immediately, but the things that accumulate over your life, hits is a great way to think about it. And so um, we are at some level accumulating different kinds of hits. And um, many people are born into circumstances or put into circumstances where there's a big ledger of hits. Maybe they're in an environment that's constantly stressful. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're in an environment where uh, there's not adequate selection of foods. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're in an environment where uh, the educational system is not supporting their families in, in a way that is useful. Right? And then you add air pollution on top of that. And, and you wouldn't be surprised to know that if you've already accumulated a bunch of other hits, that hit could be the thing that tips you, right, towards metabolic disease, towards depression, towards a whole host of things. And so, 
you know, it, it really is a situation of some people are dealing with a shallow ledger and some people are dealing with a deep ledger. And, you know, we really need to start doing true cost accounting of all these hits. We know that in a place like Louisville, and I think other areas in Kentucky too, there's certain areas which have a higher incidence of asthma and definitely complications from asthma than to other areas. We know about medications, we know about inhalers, but something tells me there's a piece to the asthma puzzle that we're missing, and I know you're going to tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I'm very hopeful that we can get to a, a chapter in medicine where we can reserve healthcare expertise for you know very complicated situations, mm -hmm. right? Like accidents and injuries and uh, you know uh, congenital diseases. Uh, but you know, for for these things like asthma, much of asthma is a preventable uh, condition, right? It is not a genetic condition. It is uh, something that over a lifetime and stages of life can mm -hmm. be exacerbated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have spent a lot of time and energy looking at uh, the circumstances that uh, support good lung development, good cardiovascular development, and those that uh, irritate them. And so, you know, people raised in very sterile environments, you know, uh, by the time they're young adults, believe it or not, uh, their immune systems are ready to attack anything that, that comes in sight. And so don't be surprised with allergens, with air pollution, mm -hmm. with whatever. Maybe we get asthma because we haven't had enough immune system training because of the environments that, that kids have been raised in. That's one hypothesis. You know, then you get into this area of the multiple hits, right? So if you've been in an environment where you're just challenging your system to an untenable extreme, well, you know, is that person going to be vulnerable to some kind of inflama you know, inflammatory, rebellious kind mm -hmm. of reaction, right? Mm -hmm. And so... We, we think the environment is the medicine, mm -hmm. and we really do think we can look at the environment as the greatest opportunity to uh, make changes that will promote good health and make us resilient enough to not have these kind of flare-up kinds of diseases. Well, let's take a more macroscopic view and talk about tree canopies. We know that in places where there are no trees, health indices go down in respiratory problems. Right? Yep and pollution is up, but yet where we have tree canopies, people, what is the association? Help me. Take yeah, me so, so that, that's fantastic. So, so this parallel of we see the phenomena, we see trees and people that, mm -hmm. that don't have disease and we see no trees and people have disease and we, you know, we, we want to say, oh, well then, you know, trees cause good health or something yeah. like that, right? And, and I think many uh, educated or just people that are paying attention, you know, kind of think, well, you know, is it that simple? And, you know, like, t tell me exactly why that would be. And so, um, you know, we actually have put a lot of energy into, well, what could it be about vegetation? And not just trees. Mm -hmm. The trees are a wonderful example um, that, that could be providing these health benefits. And, and there's a long list of things. We focused on air quality and the things that vegetation might do to improve air quality. There are many other researchers around the world who are focused on other aspects of vegetation. Does it make us want to come out and exercise? Does it calm us to look at? I mean, you know, there, there are lots of competing theories. Mm -hmm. We're focused on, on our line of thought and we're interrogating it. What's Greenheart Louisville study? So our approach to interrogating the question does vegetation like trees cause good health or reduce disease risk? Um, we're testing it in a very large clinical trial, community-based clinical trial called the Green Heart Project mm -hmm. here in South Louisville. It's the largest um, uh, trial of its kind. It's the only uh, clinical trial that it really is registered as a drug trial. And I encourage you to go to clinicaltrials.gov and look <laughs> up Heal Louisville, uh -huh. which is the clinical trial name. Um, and you will see where it would normally say the name of a medication for the intervention, mm -hmm. it says trees and bushes. And I mean, it's just worth looking at that just to look at it. So we're, we're, we have a drug trial where the drug is trees and bushes, mm -hmm. tech, very technically and legitimately. And we, are, uh, we have a, a collection of neighborhoods with 22,000 people that live in them. Sure. And we've divided them up into an intervention and control. So some people get the medication and some people don't. And um, we hope to see over a five-year period whether the vegetation, like a drug, causes good health or not. And, and that's the, the scientist's way to, to answer the question. Yeah, you know, I think we all know that throughout the Commonwealth, there are areas where, as part of the build environment, people have put in walking paths, trails throughout wooded areas, or even going through. Anecdotally, have, in those communities, are people better off? And are they better off 
because they have them and utilize them? Or Well, I can't answer the question for Kentucky. I can answer the question of the 150 peer-reviewed studies mm -hmm. from around the world that mm -hmm. essentially show at the country level, at the city level, uh, and at the block level that there is an advantage the closer you are to greenness. So I can logically answer the question across the Commonwealth, anywhere you've made it easy for people to be in and around nature like that, mm -hmm there's a high likelihood that they're having better health outcomes than people that are in hardscape built environments, you know, where it's nothing but pavement all day long and, you know, dried out brown fields and, you know, th things that are just, uh, you know, not gonna likely nourish life, right? Ted, we talked a little bit about tree canopies in certain neighborhoods. Um, we advertise ourselves in Louisville as the tree city, but we actually are going down in terms of the amount of trees we have, aren't we? Yeah, I mean, there have been a variety of tree surveys done over the years. Um, I think there's a, a goal, you know, that we'd be at something like 38% if we had the right number of trees. You know, we, we don't have to get into that. But, like, the number is not 38%. The number is 20%, 22%. And it is going down every year. And a lot of that is, you know, from, you know, sort of our development patterns. You know, we keep sprawling uh, here in this community. And, um, you know, that's really come at the expense of a lot of that canopy. So it's, uh, it's an important time to learn to appreciate uh, and, and preserve and figure out how to make it work for everybody. You know, make it work for the private sector, make it work for communities, um, you know, but learn the lessons. Just because we're seeing green because of the trees and the grass and all that, that doesn't necessarily mean that the environment is healthy or the environment is healthy for us. There are other things that we have to take into account. What are some of these? Yes, yeah, so, so um, there's plenty of examples of, of people who have bad health outcomes that are in very green places. Mm -hmm. And you can think of some parts of rural America that can be like that. And, um, and you say, well, gosh, you know, you're so smart. What, you know, it's green, what's the problem? Well, I think you know, we discussed earlier the critical importance of these multiple hits, right? So, so in many cases, uh, you, you could find people who are, you know, they may be in poverty, mm -hmm. you know, they may have, uh, you know, food issues, they may have exposures that you don't think about, like roadway exposures, gotcha. uh, you know, are a, a big deal. I mean, we picked our green heart area because uh, there was an interstate running right through the middle of the neighborhoods. It is a pervasive source of air pollution on a regular basis. So, so you know, we have to think about all those things adding up. And, and I don't imagine for a minute that a dollop of greenness will make a whole list of things go away. Uh, so we're really just trying to figure out what, you know, what the counteracting uh, effect can be. But when we talk about the determinants of health, we know that wealth and education tend to go along with that. Poor wealth, poor education, poor health. These areas which tend to be green tend to be wealthier parts of our neighborhood, wealthier neighborhoods. So is it the green or is it the fact that they have another kind of green right. <laughs> that's right. making it better? So that's, that's exactly why it's so important to do a controlled trial, gotcha. right? Where, where we're not just looking, sort of anecdotally observing things, but where we say, hey, here's a, here's a neighborhood. It doesn't have um, a maximum amount of greenness in it right now. And what if I add 10%, 15% greenness yeah. to this area? Will I see a health difference? We'll feel comfortable then because they're matched on income, mm -hmm. they're matched on occupation, they're matched on age, you know, in rough terms, uh, so that we know that it's not going to be any other factor. And so this is, this is our best uh, way, is our best tool in the tool chest to try to peel apart that relationship. Because you're absolutely right, wealthy people do live in greener environments. Uh, poorer people do live in less green environments, but that would, uh, it's important for us to be clear about which thing we think we can make a difference with. And, you know, in what order? I don't mean to sound critical, but if you bear with me, there's a project that's being talked about being built in this area, I think it's on the Indiana side, where they're talking about a park and parklands, and they said it's going to be great, people are going to be healthier, but it's going to improve business and home prices will be known to go up. Yeah, yeah. So if you do this in an area of which you're talking about and it works, 
might you raise home prices or the people who already exist there? It's I'm a, just wondering. I mean, it's no, look, unintended it's, 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 consequences. It's a really it's important point. Yeah. It's a really, really important point. Yeah. Um, so when you put a project like this together, yeah. you, you wouldn't be surprised. There's a couple of things that need to happen. I mean, uh, we need the partnership of the community yeah. in order for the trial to work, right? People need to enroll in the yeah. trial, right? So, uh, people need to agree to have things planted in their yards, right? Sure. So, so we went through two years of community discussions. Many people on our project team live in the area okay. right so they, they know the neighborhoods and they they understand the dynamics um, when we selected the location we looked at owner occupancy as yeah. a key variable so a lot of the situations that people are rightfully concerned about uh, tend to have a lot of renters right and then somebody comes in and says I got a great idea I'm gonna make this place look spiffy and when I go do that what happens is renters get displaced as the prices go up and so people do they get forced out essentially right and, and gentrification for a lot of people follow, it follows a narrative like that. Prices go up, the market changes, and people that used to live there can't afford to live there anymore. Owner occupancy is, is a helpful step, right? So that essentially says whatever we do to this environment, the wealth will accrue to the individuals mm -hmm. who live there and own their houses, right? So that's helpful. So we're improving their net worth, okay? But as you, as you said, you know, like the, this is something to be just very vigilant about. We didn't go in there to improve property values. Mm -hmm. We didn't even go in there to say, we're gonna make this a better neighborhood. Yeah. We went in there to say, you're exposed to air pollution. We think that's unfortunate. We think you're living less long as a person living in this area. Mm -hmm. And so if we can do something to remediate that air pollution exposure, that's why we're there. We're there for the health benefit. Gotcha. We're not there for the real estate opportunity. So I go to the insurance company and I say, okay, I'm gonna plant two trees and call mm -hmm. me in 20 years and let me know how things are going. Tell me about the solutions that you're seeing coming out of this now, right now. Yeah, so, so I mean, I'm not optimistic that we're gonna get a per member per month tree plan anytime <laughs> soon in anybody's <laughs> yard. Um, but I have to hope, <laughs> you know, that, that something like that is because we yeah. do have a drug trial and, and they yeah. will pay for the drugs per member per month. Yeah. So, you know, will they pay for trees? Um, so maybe that's not the realistic outcome. But yeah. I think, you know, it's very appropriate that, you know, we're kind of getting hopefully through a pandemic right now that we now have this appreciation that sometimes we've entrusted the public sector to do things for health. Yes. We treat drinking water. We treat wastewater. We decided to do that as a community. We did it for public health. Right. We all benefit from it. If I had to pay for my own water treatment system and waste treatment system at my house to keep healthy, yeah. it's just not a scalable idea. So I, I really hope that we have enlightened leadership that says this is probably something everybody's going to benefit from. We don't need the private market to pay for it as a thing, but we should agree that it's going to help everybody if we do it, which is what we did with water. I hope we will do that with air. I know we talked about heart, lungs, green heart and lungs. What other systems? Are affected well I mean so the benefits of being in nature and I guess this shouldn't be surprising um, are sort of whole body system benefits right mm -hmm. mind and body right yeah. so I mean when you look at mortality for people who live in very green environments uh, all cause mortality is improved right everything that you could possibly die of is, is improved Right. So so that's cancers, that's uh, behavioral health issues, mm -hmm. that's cardiovascular disease, that's pulmonary disease, that's autoimmune uh, immune diseases. I mean, it's it's a long list of things that we you know, we get a pervasive benefit. And I mean, I'm not personally not surprised because being in, a, in the, our ecology here mm -hmm. on this planet is probably what we've, you know, essentially spent, you know, millions of years trying to figure out how to live successfully in. And mm -hmm. so when we're not put in that ecology, don't be surprised when we have a hard time living. Ted, you're a real bright guy. So I want you to see down the road. 20 years from now, I want you to tell me what that headline is gonna say about the outcomes from your research and applications of the work and the data you've collected. Well, headlines are hard, but you know, I, I think uh, we figured out how to love our planet mm -hmm. and our place. Uh, and live longer, live better. I mean, it's somewhere in there. I mean, like it has to be a recognition that we aren't separate from all of this, that we are all connected, interconnected. We are, we are dependent on and interdependent on all of these things. The day we realize that is gonna be a big day. Mm -hmm. What wakes you up in the morning that says, I'm getting up, I'm excited to get out here and do this. That's the last thing I'm gonna ask you. 
Look, I think we, we, we have a, a tool to work with, and I, I'm really excited that I feel like I found like a tool, I found a tool that looks really useful, and I think if we can, if we can work with it, and that is really look at these environments, yeah. not blame people for their circumstances, not hide from things that look like they're too hard, but essentially, let's just commit ourselves to uh, having healthy, equitable places. I mean, that's awesome, right? So, so I want to do that. That's what it's I want to do. It's not too late. It's not too late. Okay. It's not too late. Ted, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much.